welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations. Today, I'll be having a conversation about the novel, The Lord of the Flies, by William Golding. And I'm joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. Joan, Patrick, hello. Hi, Frank. Hello, Frank. Joan, Patrick, written by William Golding and published in 1954, The Lord of the Flies is the story of a group of English schoolboys stranded on a deserted tropical island after the plane evacuating them from war-ravaged Britain crashes. How the boys struggle to survive while fighting nature, the island, and eventually even each other, make up the bulk of today's novel, The Lord of the Flies. Now, Joan, Patrick, before we start our conversation, let me ask you, Patrick, was this the first time you've read Lord of the Flies? No, Frank. Actually, probably like most people, I first read Lord of the Flies uh, in high school sometime. Probably because you had to read Lord of the Flies in high school. That's right. Do you remember how you reacted to the novel at that time? You know, I do remember that I didn't care for the book that much when I read it the first time in high school, but I have a greater appreciation for it today. Is that a greater appreciation for the story or for the writing? Probably for the story and the stuff behind the story. A little deeper reading this time around. And Joan, how about you? Is this the first time you've read Lord of the Flies? I don't know that I was in high school when I read it the first time, but I thought this is sort of a crazy book about a bunch of crazy boys. Joan, it's interesting you say that. I guess I hadn't really thought about how a woman would react to it versus how a man reacts to it. I was thinking about a young person reacting to it versus an older person. Well, now I bring a mother's perspective to it, and it's really hard to read. It is hard to read. And for me, I remember reading it as a child and thinking, oh, come on, this couldn't possibly happen. A bunch of kids out on an island, they end up killing some of them. I thought there's no way that could happen. Unfortunately, the older I get, the more I understand about the potential for man's inhumanity to man, and the more this novel rings true, and I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing. No, but fortunately, all the characters in this novel who do some awful things are kids, and we know as readers that it's man's nature that's being played out in every one of them, but they didn't have the benefit of civilization, so it's not their fault at this point. Now we realize as adults, it's our job to raise up kids so they do become civilized human beings. I agree. And I think it's just these few things we've already mentioned that make this one of the world's great stories. Well, you know, when I read the book the first time, you imagine yourself, and I was maybe a little older than the boys in the story, but you imagine yourself as one of the boys on this island. You imagine the things that you would do And I think maybe the way this grim, almost fantastical turn that the book takes is one that I couldn't imagine myself taking. So maybe that's why it didn't appeal to me all those years ago. So your parents did a good job. (laughs) But Patrick is right. At least for a boy, at the beginning, you're putting yourself into it almost like you're on a camping trip. But certainly by the time you get to the middle of this novel, it's no longer a happy-go-lucky adventure. And everybody's glad they're just snuggled up on a chair reading a book and not living it. Uh, I agree with that. All right, Patrick, tell me, how does our novel begin? Well, the book begins with a couple boys climbing out of a jungle onto a beach. And clearly the boys don't know each other. What's happened? What's going on here? Well, we quickly surmise that these boys were on a plane full of a bunch of other boys, and it crashed on this island. Or maybe was shot down. We don't really know. And we never find that out, but here they are on the island. Where are the adults? Where's the pilot? The pilot is never found, presumed to be dead. The wreckage of the plane was washed out into the ocean. So it appears to be just the boys on this island. But they know there were other boys on that plane, so they think some of them must be around. But Joan, right now we've only met these two boys. One boy is fair, blonde, and good-looking, and the other boy is not. William Golding describes the second boy as shorter than the fair boy and very fat. Looking out through thick spectacles. That's right. I forgot it. Oh, the spectacles. So the fat boy is trying to figure out who's who and what's happened. And of course, he asked the fair boy, what's your name? And it is Ralph. And then Golding writes, the fat boy waited to be asked his name in turn, but this proffer of acquaintance was not made. Well, Joan, Ralph might not want to know who this boy is, but I do. Who is he? Well, undeterred, the fat boy does keep talking. And unfortunately, he talks about his auntie and his asthma. Asthma. Yes. And Ralph is clearly looking around the island, hoping there are some other boys that survive. But finally, we do learn the fat boy's name. Well, not really. He gives us his nickname, a nickname he hates. Right. He immediately confides in Ralph, who is apparently not in the least interested in him, that he hopes that no one ever finds out the nickname that all the boys called him in school, which was Piggy which Ralph immediately begins to call him Piggy, Piggy, Piggy. And so, of course, Piggy he is. 
and piggy he shall remain. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about Ralph. Well, at this point, we know that he's 12 years old. And as Golding writes, he is old enough to have lost the prominent tummy of childhood and not yet old enough for adolescence to have made him awkward. Now, Patrick, as Ralph and Piggy get to know each other, we learn a little bit more about them. We also learn a little bit more about their situation and basically what they're in the middle of. It looks like they're part of a group of English schoolboys who are being evacuated from England because of a war. There's reference to an atomic bomb, the Reds, and we do learn that Ralph's father is apparently a commander in the Navy. And we also learn that both of Piggy's parents are dead and he's being raised by an aunt who owns a candy shop, in which he has free reign. Of course he does. And of course, they also start to talk about being rescued. And Ralph's pretty confident that his father, because he's in the Navy, is going to come and find them. But Piggy remembers that the pilot talked about this atom bomb. And no, Ralph, they're probably all dead. Golding has Piggy say, they're all dead. And this is an island. Nobody don't know we're here. We may stay here till we die. And you can tell there's just a slight change in Ralph right there where he realizes, oh, this may not be all fun and game now. Yeah, it's not just a lark. And he had taken off his school shirt, and at that he puts it back on. It's somehow strangely pleasing to him. But Joan, it's not just Ralph that changed. It seems that in that moment, even the island changes. As William Golding writes, with that word, the heat seemed to increase till it became a threatening weight, and the lagoon attacked them with a blinding effulgence. Mm-hmm, that's right. And it's at this point that Piggy now shows us his intellect. He tells Ralph, we've got to find the others. We need to get organized. Well, at that time, they were standing by a lagoon and they saw a big, huge shell in the ground. And Ralph excitedly pulls it up and Piggy recognizes it to be a conch shell. One of those shells that if you blow into it correctly, it'll make a big noise. And he wants Ralph to do it so that anybody who has survived would hear it and come to them. And Piggy gets it right. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, other boys start coming out of the jungle. Yeah, big ins and little ins. We meet the little ones first. Well, we don't really meet all these little ins, and we don't really don't even know how many there are. They just keep appearing. But they're a ragged little group, happy to find some authority on this island. And Patrick, what big ins do we meet? Well, at first, just a couple of twins, Sam and Eric. Although, which one's Sam and which one's Eric is anyone's guess. For the rest of the novel, the two boys are always identified with one name, <laughs> Sam and Eric. Right, and they're never apart, so it works. It works fine. And I'm not even sure if they know who's Sam and who's <laughs> exactly. Eric anymore. And then the choir arrives. The choir. This big black mass marching down the beach. Right. At first, it looked like some sort of strange creature. But then it became apparent that the creature, as Golding writes, was a party of boys marching approximately in step in two parallel lines, dressed in strangely eccentric clothing. That's right. They were wearing their choir gowns and their black berets with silver badges. They must have really made quite a sight coming down the beach. Right, in that tropical heat. And they're looking for the man with the trumpet. Well, Joan, who's looking for the man with the trumpet? The leader of the choir. And who's that? His name was Jack Meridu, and his face was crumpled and freckled and ugly without silliness. And Joan, Jack is here with his choir looking for the adult. He thought it was a man with a trumpet, not a boy with a conch shell. Mm -hmm. He was expecting to be rescued at this moment. Now that he knows that's not going to happen, what do these boys do? Well, as Ralph tells him, we're having a meeting. Come join us. So the first thing they actually decide to do is to elect a chief. Jack nominates himself. <laughs> I ought to be chief, said Jack with simple arrogance, because I'm chapter chorister and head boy. I can sing C sharp. Well, if that doesn't recommend him for the office, I don't know what does. <laughs> and actually, in a telling sequence, Ralph is more or less about to acquiesce to Jack and not really speak up for himself, although he feels he should be the chief, when one of the other biggins speaks up and says, you know what, let's just have a vote. And that's what they do. Who was elected chief? Well, while Jack managed to garner the dreary obedience and support of his choir, Ralph got all the other votes among the boys. He did have the conch shell, after all. And once he was voted chief, even the choir applauded him. Yes. I bet that didn't sit well with Jack. No, Jack was a bit mortified. And Ralph saw that right away and immediately said to him, well, the choir belongs to you, of course. That's right. And of course, Jack seizes on that and immediately decides that his choir will now become the Hunters. Right. And so for now, there's peace. All right, Patrick, now that they've elected Ralph as their chief, what do they decide is their next order of business? 
Well, of course, they want to be rescued. They decide that first they should figure out where they are. Are they actually on an island? They've sort of assumed that up to this point. So they decide they're going to make a little exploration or survey of the area, and they decide to climb up to the highest point they can see to look around. And Joan, who are our explorers? Well, it's a happy little trio. It's Ralph and Jack, and they pick one of the biggins, a skinny, vivid little boy named Simon. And once they get up there, what do they determine? That they are indeed on an island. Ralph notices a few things as well. Right. He sees no smoke from a village, no boats in a harbor. The island appears to be uninhabited. Well, not completely uninhabited. They do see signs of something else on the island. Well, they do find tracks through the jungle, which belong to wild boar or pigs. And they find more fun on the island because when they get to the top of this mountain, they find a big rock that they realize they can push over the side of the mountain and watch it fall to the water. And they think that's great fun. And Patrick, once they're done skipping thousand pounds stones into the sea, on their way back to the camp, they actually run into one of the other inhabitants of the island. A little piglet is caught up in the brush. That's right. And Jack jumps forward with his pocket knife, but he hesitates. And as Golding writes, the pause was only long enough for them to understand what an enormity of the downward stroke would be. And then the piglet escapes through the underbrush. Of course, Jack is embarrassed, frustrated, heartbroken that he missed his chance at getting this piglet. Oh, Jack is furious with himself, and he is determined he will not miss next time. Next time. But Joan, Patrick, that moment does pass for Jack. Mm -hmm. And quickly, the three boys come out of the jungle to the clearing and are very happy to report their findings to the other boys. Yes, this is an uninhabited island, but there does appear to be food. There's obviously plenty of water, and we'll just wait to be rescued. In fact, Ralph actually tells the group, Until the grown-ups come to fetch us, we'll have fun. Yeah, and then Jack is eager to grab that conch shell. Patrick, why does Jack reach for the conch shell? Well, they've decided as a sort of point of parliamentary order, whoever is holding the conch shell has the floor. All right, Joan, now that Jack has the conch, what does he want to tell the group? He wants to tell them about the pigs, of course, and where they found some clean bathing water. And he wants to know if anyone else found anything while they were gone. And Patrick, while no one jumps up to speak at that point, the little ones seem to be pushing out one of their group to talk to the biggins. They push out one little boy whose name we don't get, but who's identifiable because of a very prominent mulberry-colored birthmark on the side of his face. And he doesn't seem to be so sure this is a good island. That's right. He's concerned about the beastie. A snake thing, ever so big. He saw it. The big boys dismiss this as a dream, as a nightmare. But you definitely get the sense that in the back of their minds, they're at least considering the possibility of something out there. That's right. But Jack assures everyone that if there is a beastie, he and his hunters will find it and kill it. So Ralph decides it's time to get on to more important business. Like their plan for being rescued. They decide that they can help their rescuers by building a fire, a signal fire. Right. Ralph has suggested they build a fire on top of the mountain so that the smoke can be more easily seen. And the minute the boys hear fire on the mountain, decorum is lost. Jack jumps up without the conch, tells everyone to come on, follow him. And minutes later, they're all running up the mountain, leaving just Ralph and Piggy behind. That's right. And Piggy is disgusted at this sort of thoughtless exuberance. Immaturity. Like kids, acting like a crowd of kids. (laughs) But a moment later, Ralph is following them up the hill. Forcing Piggy to basically follow along in disgust. That's right. And Patrick, actually, it's a good thing that Piggy goes along to the top of the mountain, because when he gets there, he sees they've got a pile of wood, but no fire. A huge pile of wood, and nobody has any matches. No, but Jack sees those glasses on Piggy's face, and before Piggy knows it, they've been ripped from his head. Yeah, and we know this is a kid who's had an ant or two underneath a magnifying (laughs) glass before. Right, so he knows what happens when you focus the sun through some glass and quickly there is fire. Not much smoke, but a lot of fire. Meanwhile, sparks from the flames have drifted down the mountainside and ignited the jungle. By this time, Piggy is furious. And finally, he gets their attention. He says, I got the conch. Just you listen. The first thing we ought to have made was shelters down there by the beach. But the first time Ralph says fire, you go howling and screaming up this here mountain like a pack of kids. How can you expect to be rescued if you don't put first things first and act proper? And then he points out to them that this fire that they love is burning up all their food and their fuel. And that's not all, he says. Them kids, the little ones, who took any notice of them? How many we got? And he continues, the little one, him with the mark on his face. I don't see him. Where is he now? Him that talked about the snakes. He was down there, looking for wood. Do you see him? And with that, the crowd was as silent as death. 
and beneath them on the unfriendly side of the mountain, the drum roll continued. Life on this island isn't quite so fun. Now, Joan, Patrick, it seems that after these scenes on the mountaintop, the next chapter begins maybe two or three weeks later, and it appears to us that some sort of rhythm has been established. And Patrick, while these days seem to go on monotonously for weeks, finally, one day, this rhythm is broken by some new excitement. That's right. Ralph spots a ship out on the horizon. Does the ship see their smoke? Well, when they get to the top of the mountain, here's what they find. The fire was dead. The watchers were gone. A pile of unused fuel lay ready. And Ralph reached inside himself for the worst word he knew. (laughs) They let the bloody fire go out. And while the three of them stood there dazed and furious, a jubilant, happy crowd is coming up the side of the mountain, led by Jack. Patrick, why are they jubilant? Well, Frank, Jack is excited because they finally killed a pig. The twins are carrying the pig on a long stake between them. They have so much to tell Ralph. But Ralph is just standing there, repeating, you let the fire go out. Jack wants to keep up the party, but he gets the feeling that Ralph is saying something big, bigger than just, you let the fire go out. That's right. As William Golding writes, Ralph's voice was loud and savage and struck them in the silence. There was a ship. Jack, faced at once with too many awful implications, ducked away from them. Right. Jack does not want to be the one who has to admit that he caused them to lose the first ship that went by. And Joan, right at this moment, right at the peak of Jack's blood frenzy, Piggy makes the mistake and speaks up too. And he accuses Jack, you let the fire go out. We could have gone home. Right. And that's what Jack needed because Ralph's the chief. He can't hit Ralph, but he can hit Piggy. (laughs) That's right. And Piggy gave him the opening. Yes. And as Jack attacks Piggy, he slaps his glasses off and one of the lenses breaks. Well, Patrick, while this moment doesn't work out very well for Piggy, it does serve to break the tension between Jack and Ralph. That's right. So as they're sitting around enjoying their pig roast, the hunters begin reliving the hunt and acting it out and chanting, kill the pig, cut her throat, bash her in. And while that's happening, Ralph knows he has got to assert his chieftainship once more. And so he stands up and requires all of them to come down the mountain for a meeting, even if it goes into the night, into the darkness. Patrick, for a moment, this reassertion by Ralph of his leadership does seem to work. To him, this is a very important meeting. It's time to reset the rules. That's right. Letting the fire go out is just the worst example of what he's been noticing, which is this general laxness. Nothing seems to get done that they resolve to do. They're not keeping fresh water in the coconut shells like they said that they would. The whole island's becoming a latrine. And the shelters? The shelters themselves aren't standing up very well. There's been no new ones built in weeks. But most of all, Ralph makes it clear that the most important thing on this island is their fire, because that's the only thing that's going to get them off this island. That's right. Keep the fire going. Keep the smoke as a signal. Well, Patrick, it seems this assembly has at least settled some of the important matters for the moment. But the little ones, they're afraid, especially at night. That's right. They're having nightmares. They believe there's a beast or a creature out in the jungle or perhaps coming out of the water. There's even talk of ghosts out there. Right, and of course the older boys don't believe in beasts or creatures. Jack insists he's been all over the island and if there was a beast, he'd have seen it. Well, they don't want to believe in beasts and creatures. Right, Ralph acknowledges that sometimes he's frightened, but he says, but there's really nothing to be frightened of. Bonjour, this is Fabulously Delicious, the French food podcast. I'm Andrew Pryor. And every week, I bring you the wonderful and fabulous people involved in French food, whether they're here in France like me or from around the world. Each week, we dive into a specific topic, be it a French dish, an ingredient, or a French cuisine cooking technique. My guests are all about French food. So, come join me on Fabulously Delicious, the French food podcast. Bon app. But, of course, these rationalizations don't comfort the little ones much. No, it doesn't. And these little ones, they cry. They play during the day, but they cry at night. And now that it is night, William Golding does not let up the pressure on these boys. There's a surprise from the sky. Okay, And this is, of course, a reminder that there's a war going on. And apparently there's been a fighter plane battle in the sky and a pilot has parachuted out onto the island, apparently dead. But, Patrick, this poor pilot didn't just lay there. Because he was still attached to his parachute, as William Golding writes, when the breeze blew, the lines would strain taut. Then each time the wind dropped, the lines would slacken. 
and the figure bowed forward again, sinking its head between its knees. Right, so early the next morning, when it's still dark, Sam and Eric climb the mountain to get fuel to get that fire going again. When they get up there, of course, they hear the rustling of this parachute, and they see this head or beast bobbing up and down. And they don't wait there long to examine what it is. They rush down to tell everyone the beast is real and they've seen it. And Joan, as we can imagine, this news causes quite an excitement down at the camp. And it's quickly decided that the older boys, the biggins, would set out to hunt this beast. And they decide to leave Piggy back at the camp with the little ones. That's right. And this turns into sort of an all-day affair. They're searching the island. Jack suggests they should go hunting for a pig while they're looking for the beast. And that seems to make sense to everyone. And the one place they really never explored was what they call the castle area. And though they find nothing there, Jack and his hunters do like the look of it. They think it'd make an incredible fort area, and they can drop rocks on anyone who might come to attack them. They do track a large boar who leads them on a wild chase, which Ralph takes part in. Well, yeah, he actually got his spear in him. That's right, but his spear bounced off the boar's snout, and it gets away. Right, but the ominous part is they start that chant again. Kill the pig, cut his throat, kill the pig, bash him in. And that turns into a bit of uh, roughhousing, should we call it? Well, Robert might call it a little bit more than roughhousing. Well, what happens to Robert during this play, if we want to call it that? Well, they sort of relive this latest little hunt. Robert is playing the role of the boar. And the boys get sort of carried away and they begin actually jabbing Robert and beating him before they catch themselves and realize that, oh, he's not really the pig. They really do whip themselves up to a bit of a blood frenzy again, don't they? Yeah, it's a little scary. (laughs) But Patrick, they've not found the beast, they've not killed the pig, and the fire's out on the mountain. At least some of the boys have to get back up on the mountain, beast or no beast, to light that fire. And Jack sees an opportunity to jab at Ralph and pretty much dares him to go with him up the mountain now, in the dark. And with that, Ralph accepts that challenge, and surprisingly, so does Roger, and the three of them head up the mountain. And we know what they're going to find when they get up there. Yeah, but they're not going to find it till they get very close to it. And sure enough, right at that moment, the wind blows, catches that parachute, lifts that pilot's body, and scares the you-know-what out of the three boys. So now it's confirmed for all of them. There is a beast on that mountaintop, and that fire is not getting lit again. And Joan, next morning, it's actually Jack who calls an assembly to talk about the beast on the mountain. Well, really, Jack's just calling an assembly to try and Proved to everyone that Ralph is some sort of coward and he should be their chief. But what Jack thought was a good idea does not turn out well for him. That's right. So Jack says, who thinks Ralph oughtn't to be chief? He looked expectantly at the boys ranged around who had frozen. Hands up, said Jack strongly, whoever wants Ralph not to be chief. Not a single vote for Jack. And like the real humiliated 12-year-old that he is, Jack says, all right then, I'm not going to play any longer, not with you. I'm going off by myself. He can catch his own pigs. Anyone who wants to hunt when I can can come too. That's right. And as Golding finishes, he leapt down from the platform and ran along the beach, paying no heed to the steady fall of his tears. And Joan, once Jack leaves, it's actually Simon who speaks up first. He's not so convinced that they can't fight this beast. He actually wants to go back up the mountain to hunt for it. But he's quickly laughed down. And it's Piggy who comes up with the next great idea. He tells the other boys, hey, why don't we just build a fire here on the beach? It may not be as visible, but we can still build one and we can still make it smoke. Yes, and Ralph is so glad to have somebody think as clearly as Piggy. But as they go and search for fuel for that fire, not all the biggins come back. What's happening here, Patrick? Gradually throughout the day, the older boys have been drifting away from Ralph's group, going into the jungle and presumably joining Jack and his band. Well, Patrick, let's think about what's going on here. Ralph is making the big boys actually do some work. It's no fun on the beach right now. I think if I was a 12-year-old boy, I'd probably want to run off with Jack and go hunting myself. Right. Who wants to build shelters and gather firewood when you can be off having fun? And that's exactly what happens. By the end of the day, the only big ones left with Ralph at the original camp are Piggy and Sam and Eric, the twins. And all the little ones, however many they are. That's right. We've never had a real head count of all these boys. And we never do. But we do know that Simon didn't leave them for Jack. Simon went off to be by himself in the jungle. Patrick, at this point, our narrative switches back to Jack and his merry band of hunters. They're actually on a hunt. 
That's right. While everyone else has been doing chores on the beach, Jack and his hunters have killed a sow. They've cut its head off. They're hauling the carcass back to their own spot down the beach, and they're planning a big party. But Joan, the boys sure didn't discard the head of the pig that quickly. Oh, no. The head of the pig was left behind, stuck on a stake. It's an offering to the beast. And Patrick, unknown to the boys, Simon witnessed this entire scene. That's right. He's sat transfixed by the pig's head impaled on this stick. And he's watching all the flies around it. And in front of Simon, the Lord of the Flies hung on his stick and grinned. And Patrick, back at the beach, Jack's hunters realize they've got meat to eat, but no fire to cook it. Jack, however, knows exactly where he can get fire. That's right. He quickly resolves that they'll raid Ralph's party for their fire. And in fact, that's exactly what they do. And as Jack and the boys are running down the beach with their fire, Jack turns and yells back, you can come and eat with us if you like. And of course, once the little ones hear there's something to eat, they're not really interested in picking sides between Jack and Ralph. They just want to have some food. Well, Joan, it seems by the end of the day, the entire group of boys are back together again, enjoying a decent meal. Not the entire group. Oh, that's right. We left Simon transfixed before the Lord of the Flies. Unfortunately, now Simon is talking to the Lord of the Flies, and the Lord is responding. That's right. The Lord of the Flies says to him, You'd better run off and play with the others. They think you're baddie. You don't want Ralph to think you're baddie, do you? The pig's head, or Lord of the Flies, goes on, Aren't you afraid of me? There isn't anyone to help you, and I'm the beast. And then it says, Simon's mouth labored, brought forth audible words. Pig's head on a stick. Patrick, he's really trying to hold on to his sanity here. That's right, but the head just continues. Fancy thinking the beast was something you could hunt and kill. You knew, didn't you? I'm part of you. Close, close, close. I'm the reason why it's no go, why things are what they are. And this is how Golding ends the chapter. Simon found he was looking into a vast mouth. There was blackness within. Simon was inside the mouth. He fell down and lost consciousness. But Simon does come too at the beginning of the next chapter. And he comes through with his sanity. That's right. This time he looks at the Lord of the Flies, and it's not talking to him, and he's not talking to it. And as exhausted as he is, he's determined to go out and find what they call this beast so he can explain it to everybody. That's right. He finds the dead pilot and realizes, as William Golding writes, the beast was harmless and horrible, and the news must reach the others as soon as possible. He started down the mountain and his legs gave beneath him. Even with great care, the best he could do was stagger. But Patrick, as Simon staggers down the mountain with the truth, he doesn't stagger into a camp that's peaceful anymore. The boys are arguing again. That's right. As a storm arrives, Ralph points out to Jack, who's clever now? Where are your shelters? What are you going to do about that? And Jack, again, faced with this sort of responsibilities of leadership, leaps onto the sand and says, do our dance. Come on, dance, as if that's going to solve their problems. But Joan, this is not a rain dance. No. Or a no rain dance. This is a hunter's dance. Right. Unfortunately, soon they're all chanting, kill the beast, cut his throat, spill his blood. That's right. The chants get louder and more insistent. Kill the beast, cut Cut his his throat, throat, spill spill his his blood. blood. And as they continued chanting, the boys formed a circle. And then the circle became a horseshoe. A thing was crawling out of the forest. It came darkly, uncertainly. The beast stumbled into the horseshoe. Kill Kill the the beast. beast. Cut Cut his his throat, throat, spill spill his blood. blood. Simon was crying out something about a dead man on a hill. Kill Kill the the beast, beast. cut Cut his throat, throat. spill Spill his blood, do Do him in. in. The beast was on its knees in the center, its arms folded over its face. It was crying out against the abominable noise, something about a body on the hill. Golden continues, at once the crowd surged after it, poured down the rock, leapt onto the beast, scream, struck, bit, tore. Then the clouds opened and let down the rain like a waterfall. And softly, Simon's dead body moved out toward the open sea. When our story resumes the next morning, left at the old camp are just Ralph and Piggy, along with Sam and Eric, and a couple little ones. But they don't have a lot of time to contemplate what happened last night, because now they have to deal with the next invasion. Patrick, at Castle Rock, they don't have fire. That's right, and the only fire starter on the island is Piggy's remaining eyeglass lens. And Jack knows where to get that. So that night, Jack and his men raid Ralph and Piggy's camp and steal Piggy's eyeglasses. And Piggy is essentially blind now. And Joan, with Piggy being blinded, he really comes to the only conclusion he can. He has to go to Jack. He has to ask for his glass back. He needs to be able to see. And they need to be able to make fire. 
And Ralph knows that's what they have to do, too. It really has come down to their survival now. Right. Patrick, that's what the boys do. They set off for Castle Rock. Three of them are armed with spears, but Piggy is armed with a conch. That's right, the conch, which from day one on the island, they've used to call the assemblies, and it's represented order and civilization on the island. But Joan, what the boys find when they get to Castle Rock is anything but order and civilization. And all their blood is up now because they've just killed another pig. But Joan, it's actually Ralph who takes the conch back and tries to reassert his leadership. He does. He blows that conch and tells those boys he's calling an assembly. But the boys have really become savages now. They're all painted. They're truly wild. And they're all armed. Right, with their hunting spears. This is now the showdown between Jack and Ralph. But Joan, in a desperate attempt to stop this fight and try to restore order, Piggy grabs the conch. Yes, he does. And for a moment, the fighting stops. Everything stops. And Piggy makes a bold statement. You're acting like a crowd of kids. Which is better, to be a pack of painted Indians like you are or to be sensible like Ralph is? And that's the last we hear from Piggy. Patrick, what happens to Piggy? High overhead, Roger, with a sense of delirious abandonment, leaned all his weight on the lever. What was on that lever? There was a massive rock. In his golden rights, the conch exploded into a thousand white fragments and ceased to exist. Piggy fell 40 feet and landed on his back across the square red rock in the sea. His head opened and stuff came out and turned red. And then he writes, this time the silence was complete. But Joan, Jack makes plenty of sounds. He starts screaming wildly, throws his spear at Ralph, and now a new hunt is on. Ralph knows he's really the pig now, and he's being hunted. And Patrick, Ralph is able to evade Jack and the others for about 24 hours, but eventually they do corner him in a bramble thicket. Right, and they can't quite get in there, so savages that they are, they decide to set a fire to flush Ralph out. To burn him out. Of course, it's going to burn themselves out, too. Yeah, but they're not thinking that far ahead, are they? No. And Joan, once the fires do start, Ralph has to abandon his little hiding hole. And the only place he can go is towards the water. And Patrick, with Ralph's last dash for freedom, he stumbles out of the forest and onto the beach. Landing at the feet of a British naval officer. The officer grinned cheerfully at Ralph. We saw your smoke. What have you been doing? Having a war or something? Nobody killed, I hope. Any dead bodies? And Joan, Ralph surprises him with his answer. Right, he says, only two, and they've gone. The officer knew, as a rule, when people were telling the truth. He whistled softly. And then slowly all the other survivors straggle onto the beach. But Joan, the officer still can't believe what he's seeing. He asks, who's in charge here? Who's the boss? And Ralph speaks up and says, I am. He says, I should have thought a pack of British boys would have been able to put up a better show than that. And Ralph says, it was like that at first... Before, and nobody can finish their thoughts now. The tears are flowing now. And in the middle of them, with his filthy body, matted hair, and unwiped nose, Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart, and the fall through the air of the true, wise friend called Piggy. The officer, surrounded by these noises, was moved and a little embarrassed. He turned away to give them time to pull themselves together and waited, allowing his eyes to rest on the trim cruiser in the distance. And Patrick, Joan, that's how our novel, Lord of the Flies, ends. Boys at war and men at war. Yes. yes. But Joan, Patrick, before we end our novel conversation, I know there's at least one quote that you want to read from the book. The quote that I chose to read involves Ralph, and it's because of these meetings he's had to become the leader. And this is what he thinks about having to be the leader. The trouble was, if you were a chief, you had to think. You had to be wise. Because thought was a valuable thing, and that got results only decided Ralph as he faced the chief seat. I can't think. Not like Piggy. Piggy could think. He could go step by step inside that fat head of his. Only Piggy was no chief. Right. That's when Ralph realizes that part of leadership is recognizing the skills of your team members. And your own shortcomings. Right. Patrick, how about one of your favorite lines? All right. The setting here is an assembly where the biggins, the older boys, have been trying to convince the little ones that there really are no beasties or monsters. And I like this passage because here Simon is really the only character that's really wrestling with the problem that they're really facing on this island and trying to deal with it instead of crying about beasts or just saying they don't exist. Simon has grabbed hold of the conch and says, maybe, he said hesitantly, maybe there is a beast. The assembly cried out savagely and Ralph stood up in amazement. You, Simon, you believe this? I don't know, said Simon. His heartbeats were choking him. But 
what I mean is maybe it's only us. We could be sort of... And then Golding says of Simon, Simon became inarticulate in his efforts to express mankind's essential illness. And it's so sad because you know that Simon's going to get no help from this crowd. No matter what else we think about this novel, we all can agree that William Golding was not inarticulate when it came to expressing mankind's essential illness. No, he wasn't. Nope. Joining me now for endnotes on today's conversation is our researcher, Ted Schwartz. Hello, Ted. Hi, Frank. Ted, the readers and I think The Lord of the Flies is trying to tell us something. Oh, yes? Yes. We think that when William Golding has The Lord of the Flies say to Simon, you knew, didn't you? I'm part of you. I'm the reason why it's a no-go, why things are what they are. Golding is telling us we're all savages. Is that what Golding's trying to tell us? Most definitely, and starting with himself. So Golding's starting point was not the savageness of man. It was the savageness of William Golding? Very much so. When Golding was a student at Oxford, he came home. There was a neighbor girl he had known for several years, and he tried to force himself on her. She got away. Later, he did the same thing to another girl, and though she escaped, he realized how capable he was of violence towards others. Well, Ted, at what point did this understanding that he was capable of evil become more generalized in his mind that all men are capable of this kind of evil? This is something I'd love to know more about. What we do know is that after he was done at Oxford, he got a teaching job, and he decided as an experiment to take his male students, divide them into two groups, and let them fight out for control. It seems I've read this scenario before. A little bit like Lord of the Flies. This was well before that, but what fascinated him were two things. One is how quickly it devolved into savagery, and the second, that he let it. Well, Ted, I can understand how those experiences might form Golding's belief that there's an inherent savageness or evil in young boys who maybe haven't been tutored yet or haven't grown up yet. But for me, this novel was really about the inhumanity of man. When does that crystallize in his mind? When Golding was a young man, World War II broke out and he served his country. In doing that, he realized that everybody, both the ones declared good and the ones declared bad, were capable of great violence, great horror. But Ted, William Golding was a British officer fighting for the British. Are you telling me he couldn't see the evil of Nazi Germany? That wasn't the point. He saw it very well. He recognized that there were two sides and that one in his mind might be better, but he also saw that if he had been born in Germany, he would have been a Nazi. Not because he sympathized, but because this was, again, the nature of humanity. He would have been caught up in their cause instead of the one where he was born. Wow, Ted, I guess the Lord of the Flies really was trying to tell us something. Most definitely. Ted, as always, thanks for bringing your endnotes to today's conversation about the novel Lord of the Flies by William Golding. You're welcome. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews, for joining me today in a conversation about the novel Lord of the Flies by William Golding. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourselves in a novel conversation. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. Listen to more great conversations at thefrontporchpeople.com. Thank you for listening. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place. The sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com. And listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.